um, trying to get the screen up just right so we can see everything. How's everybody doing? Can you see me okay? Good. I see you. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, <clears throat> good. Trying to optimize this. All right. How's everybody doing today? You don't have to respond. That's okay. Uh, doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to start for today. And people are joining. Good. So we're going to um, we're going to do a 2.4 today. And let me get this off to the side so I can see what's going on. Um, and then we'll do 2.5 tomorrow. Um, 2.5, we may go um, with 2.5. We may have a chance to start 2.6 as well. Um, if we can't start um, 2 and Thursday, we're going to do it on. Um, oops, shoot. Yeah. Um, so getting people coming in from the waiting room. So we're, we're going to do 2.5 today, for today, 2 tomorrow. Um, and then uh, if you guys have questions, remember um, the homework is due Thursday on, very good, uh, the homework is due Thursday by midnight. So we'll have our office hours on Thursday. If you guys wanted to um, come by on Thursday and ask questions, um, you're uh, more than welcome to do that. Also Thursday, just as a reminder, um, in the afternoon, you know, sometime after office hours and everything, I'll start the, um, the window for our uh, uh, um, window, our, I say our window because our quiz is going to be um, a 24 hour window to accommodate different time zones. Um, there will be a time run. So when you start it, then um, you'll, um, I'll probably give you like 45 minutes for it for the quiz. Um, and then you'll get like an additional 15 minutes to upload and technology stuff. The 15 minutes actually comes from my department. The math department um, wants us only to give people 15 extra minutes to upload technology, upload quizzes and stuff. But don't sweat it. I'm flexible about it. If things go wrong, like you can't, um, you're having trouble uploading or things don't work, um, you know, don't worry about it. Email it to me um, so that we know that the time and date stamp is fine, and then you can keep trying to upload it. Um, so we'll we'll be flexible about it. But I'm supposed to only give you 15 minutes for that. We'll go over um, tomorrow, and I'll post an announcement on like how you guys can take the quiz, what's expected, how you're supposed to do stuff. So um, I know it seems a little bit unknown right now. But, um, in more as well as I'll post an announcement so that we'll actually have like a, um, a methodology for how we're going to do it. Okay. And then the homework, um, you guys should be able to upload, please upload PDFs because that's, I can actually make comments on a PDF. If it's a JPEG, um, I have a harder time making comments on a JPEG. Um, a PDF, I can actually write it on top of it. Um, so when you upload that, then, um, you know, on Thursday by midnight, then I can actually, you know, take a look at it on, uh, I'll take a look at it on Friday probably. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. We're going to do um, chapter 2.4 today. Very uh, exciting stuff. Chapter 2.4 is called conditional probability. Let's see if we can get this camera straight here. Give me a second here. I'm trying to get that oriented. Okay. Alright, so chapter 2.4. And it's called conditional probability. And we're going to describe what that means, um, different aspects of it. Um, we're going to go through a bunch of examples. Okay. So conditional probability is basically like, you know, let me write it down and then we'll talk about it. The probability of an event, A, may have to be changed, we'll call it adjusted, if we know that some related event like we'll call that B, event B, has already occurred. Okay, so so far what we've talked about is like I have event A, I've got my sample space. I have event B, I've got my sample space. Maybe event A and B overlap, maybe they don't. 
we've talked about probabilities um, for A, we've talked about probabilities for B, we've talked about you know, um, their intersection or their union. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about conditional probability, which is basically like saying, um, in order for A to happen, B has to have already happened, or vice versa. In order for B to happen, A has to have already happened. So the probability of A happening is dependent on probability of B happening, okay? So we're gonna talk about that. So let's write down, um, we'll talk about what it means to have dependent events. Um, sorry, I just had to mute you. I could hear stuff in the background. It was distracting me. I'm getting used to all this. All right, so dependent events. Let's define what that means. So dependent events are kind of like taking our conditional probability and we're going to make it um, more specific about events. So when the outcome or occurrence of the first event affects the outcome or occurrence of the second event. And this is done in such a way that the probabilities are going to change. Okay, so they're dependent on each other. The, um, the basically, I can't have the second event unless the first event has already happened. Okay, so we have dependent events that are happening here. I got to get this out of the way. I can't see my screen. All right. <clears throat> so this is like an example where, say, right, I'm going to draw a card from a deck. And I'm not going to replace it. And I'm going to draw another card. Right. I have a smaller sample size, right? Because I've already taken one card out. It's going to affect the probabilities of everything else that are happening after that. Okay, so I'm taking a card from the deck. I'm doing something with it, perhaps. And then I'm going to take another card from the same deck. Okay. Um, also, we're going to do a lot of things where we have like buckets or urns, our, our book calls them urns, um, where I'm going to take something out of that, right? And then based on what I'm getting from there, right, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to flip a coin and I'm going to make a decision and then I'm going to take things out of a bucket. Okay, so we're going to talk about the probability of getting some kind of event based on a path of events that we're talking about, okay, things that are dependent on other stuff happening prior to that happening, okay. And then we're also going to talk at the end um, of all of this stuff and something called Bayes' theorem, which maybe you've heard if you've taken like a, um, say, an AI class, artificial intelligence class, or a neural network class. Um, Bayes' theorem um, in this whole conditional events basically makes up um, the way that um, our brain actually functions in terms of firing patterns of the neurons and also how we think about um, artificial neural networks. Okay, so we'll get to that um, towards the end. I'll point that out based there. Okay, so let's talk about we have a multiplication rule. Oops, sorry, sorry. A multiplication rule. For dependent events. This out of the way here. I'm having a hard time seeing my screen. Okay, for dependent events, and this is our conditional probability. Okay, so this is like saying when two events, we call them A and B, are dependent, the probability. of both occurring is set up like this. So I'm going to say the probability <clears throat> of A and B, okay, which is the same thing as saying the probability of A 
intersect B, right, because I want both of them to be occurring, okay, is going to equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. This is what we call, this is B given A, okay. So what this means is A is happening first, okay, and now I need to know what the probability of A is, right, because A is happening first. Given that A has already happened, what is the probability of B happening? That's what this is right here. Probability of B given A. That's how we read it. And I'll write that out specifically here. Um, so I can say the probability of B, whoops, I just heard it see. B given A. Sorry, that's an A. Um, I had a quick question. Okay. okay. Um, so you said the, the probability of A and B, um, <clears throat> how do we determine when you're talking about, um, a dependent event versus a non-dependent event? Like yeah. When we're yeah, that's great. So chapter 2.5 actually is independence. So we're going to spend a whole chapter section on what it means to have independence. So today, right, is, yeah, so today is about dependent events and um, conditional probability based on events that are dependent on one another. And then tomorrow we're actually going to talk about how we know that things are independent um, and what does it mean to be independent and how do we calculate things given that they're independent. Right, because earlier we saw the P, uh, P of A, um, the inner, it's intersection, right? Right here, P of A and B intersect. Yeah, so remember, this is like in our sample space, right? I've got A and B. Right, mm -hmm. and this is the intersection of the two happening. So if this is like saying A is happening first, so I've got this whole thing. So A has to happen. So I need to know what's the probability of A actually happening. Right, and given that A has actually happened, right, so we're talking about this space right here, then mm -hmm. what's the probability of B happening given that A has already happened. So these two events right. are dependent on each other. We're gonna work through a whole bunch of examples today so that you'll see that there's a pathway. I'm going to flip a coin based on the outcome of the coin. I'm going to do something here or I'm going to do something there, right? Or based on the outcome of some other event, I need to do some other action, okay? Right. Um, I, I mean, like, um, because when you give like P, A, intersection B, uh -huh. like in previous days, that meant that um, <clears throat> you were talking about two events happening, but n n they weren't dependent. Right, exactly. Right. So they weren't dependent on each other. And now in this case, they are dependent. And so um, that's part of what we're going to be decomposing when we talk about these examples. You'll see in the examples, right, um, why they're dependent on each other, right, yeah. and how it is because, um, you know, like, like I said, I can't do one action until something else has already happened. So in order for me to do the secondary action, I have to have already accomplished this right here. Yep. So that's yep. part of what we'll be reading about when we're thinking about our examples. Okay. But um, hold your thoughts on what defines exactly independence, because we're actually going to get into it in quite a bit of detail. And it is an important factor um, because it, it basically makes up part of the statistics that we're going to be doing that events are independent or they're dependent. Okay. Uh, Need to right. be able to so we'll get into that um, tomorrow. 2.5 is independent. All right, thank you very much. Right, sure, no problem. All right, um, so where am I? So probability of B given A, we're gonna write this out just so that you guys have the definitions and what it means and how, how to read it in your mind when you see this right here. Okay, so probability of B given A, or I can say the probability of A given B. You know, and it's going to be like the nature of um, the problem that we're working on and um, how we set things up and what we're being asked to do. Okay, so let's talk again. Let's talk a little more detail about um, conditional probability. Okay, so conditional probability. So let's define it formally and then we'll start working on stuff. So we're going to say any probability that is revised to take into account the 
the known occurrence of other events. Okay, so that's our conditional probability, like a formal definition. Okay, so what this does, the effect of this information. Let me write it down, then we'll talk. So what happens when we have a conditional probability is we're changing our sample space in some possible way. Often we're shrinking our sample space because we're saying, I need to have had this event have occurred before something else has actually happened. Okay, so like say for example, you know, I've got, um, I'm gonna roll a six sided die, right? And then the sides go one, two, three, four, five, six, they're all numbered, one through six, right? So basically my sample space is one, oops, I did that one. Right, so, oops, sorry, you move this up here so you can see. So my sample space, right, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, as my possible outcomes, okay? So then, um, basically, the chance of picking out any particular face assuming it's a fair die, it's gonna be one out of six, right? So the probability that I'm gonna get a one probability I'm going to get a six, the probability I'm going to get a three, they're all equal in probability if it's a fair die, okay? But now if I say, what's the probability of any face given that it's an even number that was cast, right? So I know that an even number has appeared, okay? And then I want to know what's the probability of any particular face given that it's an even number. So I'm looking at my sample space and now I'm only looking at even numbers. So I've revised my sample space, right, to only include my even numbers, right, because I've said it's only an even number that's come up. I rolled the die, it's only an even number. That's the only thing I'm looking at. So what's the probability of any given face given that it's an even number, right? Well, I only have three options in my sample space. And I'm looking at what's the probability of any given face given that it's been an even number. So I've reduced my sample space, okay, which means I've also, in this case, increased my probability of getting an answer, okay? All right, <clears throat> so let's take a look. I'm gonna pull up my um, sheet, my example sheet, okay? And we're gonna take a look at example one, which says that, you guys all see that, good. Um, for a specific year, 5.2% of US workers were unemployed, okay, during that time, 33% of those who are unemployed received unemployment benefits. If a person is selected at random from this pool, right, find the, or a person is selected at random, find the probability that he or she received unemployment benefits if they were unemployed, okay? So we've got the general population, right? That's our sample space. Now we're shrinking that sample space to just take a look at people who are unemployed. We wanna find out within that sample space, those people, okay, who were receiving unemployment benefits. So let's write down what we have, okay? So we're looking at, we wanna look at the probability of unemployment benefits and being unemployed. Okay, so we're looking at the population of people who are unemployed and within those, who's receiving unemployment benefits, okay? So that's gonna be the probability of someone being unemployed, I'll call that you. And I'm gonna say that's the probability of them receiving benefits given that they're unemployed. Okay, I'm just using these letters here as acronyms for what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, but let's write it out. So this is the probability of being unemployed times the probability of receiving benefits given they're unemployed. Okay, so we're putting it in words just so that we 
can translate what we're trying to say in terms of math, okay? So the probability that somebody is unemployed, we were given that right here. Okay, our percentages, remember, are another way of reflecting probability. So we have to convert them from a percentage into a probability, which means I gotta make it into a decimal. So I'm gonna divide by 100. So this is 0 0.052, okay? Of this, right, I'm looking at 33% of those people who were unemployed received unemployment benefits, okay? So this 33% is gonna give me the probability of getting benefits given that they were unemployed. Right, I take 32%, divide by 100, I get 0.33. Now I'm gonna multiply them together and I'm gonna get 0 0.017. This here is the probability, we'll write this down, this is the probability that a person is unemployed and receiving unemployment benefits. Okay. In order to get the benefits, you have to be unemployed. So what's the probability of being unemployed? Okay, so we're putting these together. This is our conditional probability, okay? Getting the benefits is conditional upon you being actually unemployed. Okay, so another one. Example two, and there. Okay, so example two says, 53% of the residents of a city, particular city, had homeowner's insurance, we'll call that H for homeowner's insurance, with a particular company. Of these clients, 27% uh, also had automobile insurance with the same company, okay? We'll call that A, event A, that's automobile. If a resident is selected at random, find the probability that they have both homeowner's insurance and automobile insurance with this company, okay? So let's think about it. We're looking at, we wanna find the probability of homeowner's insurance and automobile insurance, okay? So that means I have to have, what's the probability of homeowner's insurance times the probability of automobile insurance given that they already have homeowner's insurance, okay? This is all in saying they're doing it by the same company, okay? So I'm gonna start filling in the blanks. So the probability that they have homeowner's insurance is given to us right here. Okay, the probability that they have automobile insurance given that they also have homeowners by the same company was given to us right here. Okay, and I just multiply things through and I get 0 0.1431. Okay, so we could say, well, there's a 14.3% chance that they're gonna have this, so I can leave this as the probability, which is 0.1431. Okay, they're both okay. Okay. This chapter has a lot of examples. We're just gonna work our way through them. Okay, so in this one, we'll talk about um, three or more um, different things that are happening, okay? So we've got three cards that are being drawn from a deck and they're not being replaced. Okay, so I take a card out, I look at it, I take another card out, I look at it, I take another card out. I'm not putting things back. So each time I take it out, my sample size is decreasing as I go. We wanna find the probability of all these particular events. Okay, so we're gonna work our way through. So part A, which is the probability that we're gonna get three jacks. So I'm taking three cards out. So the first card is a jack, the second card is a jack, the third card is a jack, okay? So I need to think about that. So um, jacks, right? The number of jacks, so jacks, I have one jack in each suit, right? So I have one, two, three, four, four different suits. That means I have four jacks total. So on the first card that I take out, right? I have 52 cards total. I have four jacks that are possible. That's my first card. On my second card taken out, I will now only have three jacks left because I took out a jack on the first card. I didn't replace it. So I have one less card to draw from in my sample size. And I have one less jack in my little, you know, my little pile of jacks, okay? On my third card, same thing. I have one less jack to draw from and one less card in my sample size. So I multiply, these are all being multiplied. This is approximately just multiplied 2.1, 2, 3, 0, 0, 0, 2. Okay, so kind of think it through about what you're being given. So probability of an ace, a king, a queen in that particular order. So we're looking for a, K, Q, okay. So I need to think about what I have. So probability, okay. So what I'm actually gonna do is I pull it out and I say, okay, so I have an ace, I have four aces, okay, one for each suit. I have 52 cards on the first draw, right? I have four kings because I have one in each suit. 
but I have one less card to deal with, okay? And then a queen, I have four queens because one for each suit, but I have one less card that I'm working with, okay? Which is gonna give me approximately 0 0.25, okay? All right, um, we wanna get a club, a spade, and a heart, okay? So thinking about a club, spade, and a heart, okay? So as I work it through, I'm thinking about my clubs, my spades, my hearts. Clubs, spades, and hearts are all suits, okay? Which means I have 13 cards, okay, in each suit. So a club, I have 13 cards to choose from out of the whole deck. A spade, I have 13 cards to choose from out of a deck that has one less card in it. And then I have hearts, I have 13 cards to choose from out of one less card in my deck. So I multiply everything through. This is approximately equal to 0 0.017. Okay, so the probability of three clubs, okay, as we're working it through. All right, so clubs. Clubs is a suit. So on the first draw, I have 13 possible clubs out of 52 total sample space. Okay, but I have one less club to possibly choose from, and I have one less card in my sample space. On the third draw, I have one less club to choose from out of one less card in my whole sample space. And this is equal to 0 0.013. Okay, so we're looking at our sample spaces, we're looking at what's being asked, how we're going to be working it through. <clears throat> Okay, example four. Let's see if I have enough space for this. Um, if we need to go onto a separate page, I'll just work it on a different page. Okay, so um, these are common questions here. So we've got um, box one contains two red balls and one blue ball. Our, our homework problems, our test problems have a lot of conditions where we've got this a bucket or an urn or a box or something with balls or chips of different colors and then you know probabilities change as you make decisions. Okay, um, box two. <laughs> contains three blue balls and one red ball. A coin is tossed. If we get a head, then we go to box one. If we get a tail, then we go to box two, okay? We, what we wanna do is find what's the probability of selecting a red ball. So the coin toss is gonna tell us which box we're choosing from, okay? So, let's see, where am I here? Let me get this up on the page. Okay, so I'm gonna draw this out first as a chart. Okay, and then we're going to think about, you know, tracing our path and thinking about our probabilities as we go. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I've got a coin that gets tossed, right? My coin, we're going to assume that the coin is a fair coin, right? That I can have a, you know, half chance of getting ahead, 50% um, chance of getting a tail. Okay, so if I toss the coin and I get a head, okay, the probability of getting a head is equal to one half. Okay, so if it's a fair coin, which we're going to assume that it is. So if I toss that, I'm going to get, go to box one. Okay, so box one contains two red balls and one blue ball. Okay, now what they want to know is, what's the probability of selecting a red ball? So we're going to do both the red and the blue, just so you can kind of see how the probabilities come together. So from here, I can select a red ball or a blue ball, red ball or a blue ball, okay. Now, if I select a red ball, this is, we're going to call the probability of getting a red ball given that we're in box one, which means that I've, I tossed a head on the first one, okay? So this right here is going to be, I've got two red balls out of three balls total, so that's a two-third right there. Now here, this part is probability of getting a blue ball considering we've tossed a head, okay? And what that means is I have one blue ball out of three balls total, so this is one third. I'm doing out the blue balls just so you can see all the probabilities, but the thing that we're looking for is the red. So I'm just gonna do a little circle here because this is what we want, the red. Okay, because that was at, we, were, we were asked to look for the red. Okay, so that's if we toss the head. So let's try if we toss the tail. Okay, so now our probability of tossing the tail is one half, right? Unless we're told otherwise, we're gonna assume things are fair. This means we go to box two, and box two has, let's draw it out. We have three blue balls, and we have one red ball, 
Okay, so we have four balls total in this one, right? We have more blue balls than red ones. Now, let's think about it, right? I can either toss a red, or I can choose or a red, or I can choose a blue, okay? So the probability of choosing a red ball, given that we tossed a tail, right, right here, because right, we're in box two, is gonna be, we've got one out of four total. Now here, this is the probability of choosing a blue ball given that we tossed a tail. And that's gonna be three out of four. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna put a little circle around this because this is red, right? This is the ones, the conditions that satisfy what we are being tasked to look for, okay? So <clears throat> what I need to do is follow this path, right? I have one half, right, as my probability of tossing a head times two thirds, which is the probability of getting a red given that I tossed a, um, a, a head. So I'm gonna say this is one half times two thirds. So let's write this out. This is the probability, right, of tossing a head times the probability of pulling out a red ball given that we tossed a head, okay? <laughs> now let's do this red right here. This is the probability of tossing a tail times the probability that we're choosing a red ball given that we toss the tail. Okay, so this is, we're gonna follow this path, one half times one fourth. <coughs> okay. Um, incidentally, I just want to show you, this is one half times one third. I'll write that down in a different color so we can see. So this is the blue. We're not gonna count up the blue ones. We only want the red because that was our, our task, but I'm just gonna show you. So I go one half times one third, right, to get the blue balls. And this is one half times three fourths. Okay, so one half times three, one third is one sixth. One half times is three eighths. Now, if I sum up, right, one third plus one sixth plus one eighth plus three eighths, right, it should sum up to one. The probabilities of our whole sample space should sum to one, okay? This is just, the stuff in light blue is just incidental. I don't know if you can see it very well. I'm gonna scan this in so you can see it later. But we're only concerned with the red ones, but I just wanted to show you that our sample space is gonna sum to one, okay, in terms of probabilities. All right, so let's take a look. I've got the one third and the one eighth, because we have two different ways that we can get a red ball, right? I can toss a head, I can get a red ball, I can toss a tail, I can still get a red ball. Okay, so I need to be able to put those together in some meaningful way. So, <clears throat> probability of A and B, right? We said we do, we're just doing this. I'm just gonna write out probability of B given A. Okay, so the probability of getting a red ball is gonna equal to, I'm gonna sum these up, right? This is one third plus one eighth. Okay, so I'm adding each, each of these, right, I have to sum these up because each is a separate path. Sorry, so you can see that. One third and one eighth, I'm gonna add these up. <clears throat> Gives me 1124, which is approximately equal to 0 0.458. Okay, so given the way that we've distributed, right, our numbers of red balls in each box, and given that we have a fair coin, okay, we have about a 45.8 chance of actually pulling a red ball out, okay, of, or just getting a red ball in general, okay, given that we're tossing a coin and we're pulling it out of either box one or box two, okay? <laughs> and let's see, we can, um, yeah, I guess I'll write this out here. So this is probability of head. Okay. Just so you can see where all those numbers came from. So let's go back to our conditional probability event. Um, and I want to be able to talk about, I'm going to kind of finesse some of these a little bit more pictures too. Okay, so in terms of conditional, So we're gonna say that the probability, our conditional probability is the probability that event B is gonna occur after event A has already occurred, okay? That's our conditional probability of B in relationship to A, 
And it also goes the other way too. I can say the probability of event A in relation to event B. So what I can say is probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. All I did was rearrange that equation that we had before, right? We were multiplying these two together and making it equal to the intersection. More often than not, we have our individual probability, the intersection probability, and we're trying to find out what's the conditional probability, okay? So we're just manipulating the equation that we were looking at before. And this is also assuming I need to write this down, that the probability of B is greater than zero. We don't want to get a divide by zero error, okay? <clears throat> and this is going to be true even if the outcomes are not equally likely. Um, I'll also write down the converse on this too. I can say the probability of B given A, it's going to look like because right, remember, A intersect B is the same thing as B intersect A. Okay. You want to read this as A has already occurred, right? In order for B to occur, A has to have occurred. So I need to know, let's write this too. I need to know what's the probability of A in order for that to happen. Okay, so I'm looking at, you know, the sort of proportional experience here. And I can think about it, right? Remember our sample space and how things come together. We'll write this in terms of probability. So here's our probability of A, here's our probability of B. This right here, draw it out here. This is our probability of A intersect B. And this is our probability of our sample space, okay? So this is how we're thinking about things, right? Given our, our diagrams, okay? <clears throat> so all we did was kind of move the equation around a little bit. Okay, so let's take a look at um, example number five. Okay, so the um, probability, so we're looking at example five. So we're going to draw a card from a deck of cards. We want to know what's the probability um, that the card is a club, given that it's a king, right? So we take it out, we can see that it's a king. We want to know what's the probability that it can be um, uh, a club, okay? So let's just write down some information about what we know about a deck of cards and the numbers of um, events, like the numbers of clubs, the numbers of kings. And then, um, then we'll talk about um, the probabilities of stuff. So, um, and this helps too when you're given a problem to start enumerating things and thinking about stuff um, and then as you're working it through because you've been starting to write things down then maybe you'll get ideas about how you're going to solve this and what you need to do okay so the number of clubs number of clubs is a suit so i have 13 cards in my suit kings is a type of card it's a face card we have one card one king card in each suit which means i have four kings total in a deck of cards and i also have the king of clubs, and there's only one card like that, okay? <laughs> so I can say that the probability of clubs, right, is going to equal to 13 over 52, right? Because so we have 52 cards in the deck. The probability of kings is going to be 4 out of 52, and the probability of the king of clubs is going to be 1 out of 52. Here okay, we're just writing down some basic knowledge because we're going to need it, right? So what we're being asked to do here is we're going to look at the probability that the card is a club, oops, club, given that it's a king. Okay, so we're kind of starting to see the pieces as we can put things together, right? So the probability of a club given that it's a king, okay? which is going to be the probability of the king and clubs together all over the probability of kings. Okay. So this is, right, we had this from before, 1 out of 52. The probability of kings, 4 out of 52. Okay, so I divide both fractions, I'm going to get 1 out of 4. Okay, so the probability that it's a club, given that it's a king, is 1 fourth. Okay. <coughs> All right, let's see, um, this one. So example six, we have, example six says, okay, get this centered here. Um, we've got a box that contains black chips and white chips. There's a lot of these. Black chips and white chips, and a person selects two chips without replacement. If the probability of selecting a black chip and a white chip is 15 out of 56, and the probability of selecting a black chip on the first draw is 3 out of 8. 
then the probability of selecting the white chip on the second draw, given that the first chip was black, is something that we want to find. Okay, so we know what the probability of getting both of them, okay, that I, both chips, one is black, one is white, the probability of getting the first chip being black, we want to know what's the probability of getting a white chip, given that the first one was black. Okay, so we're kind of building up pieces here, okay. So let's write down the things that we have. So I'll just write down our events. So the event B, I'll call it, is the selecting a black chip. Right, that's my event B. W is the event of selecting a white chip. Okay, so now I want to say the probability of getting a white chip given that a black chip was selected already. Okay, which means I have to do the probability of black and white. Okay, so both chips all over the probability that the black chip was chosen already. Okay, so this is the probability of both occurring, given that the black one came first. Okay, so we're gonna fill in the um, information from what we were given. Okay, so this 15 out of 56 is the probability that we have both a black and a white chip. And the probability of getting a black chip on the first draw is three out of eight. Okay. And so I, you know, uh, divide by fraction, I get a simplification, and my approximation is 0.714. Um, some of you asked me about, should we leave it as a fraction or should we convert it to decimal? I will take both, okay? As we move along um, into the statistics portion of the class, we're going to be dealing with probabilities as decimals. So it might be good in your mind to, you know, kind of do both, just so you can start to see how the probabilities translate into decimals, because you know, when we talk about statistics, the probabilities will all be in decimals for the most part. Okay. So this is, we'll write this down too, the probability of selecting a white chip on the second draw, given that the first chip was black. Okay, sometimes it helps to write it down just so you can see. I'll leave that there so you can see that. <clears throat> okay. Um, we're cruising through these examples here, which is great. Um, so we want to think about that. Um, so example seven, right, says we're going to give, um, we have two events. Um, a and B. Now, the thing I want to notice, um, there's actually some typos in here I want to clear up. This is actually the probability of B alone. Okay, so probability of B is that whole circle on our Venn diagram. B alone is that little chunk, right, where we take out the intersection of A and B. Okay, so the probability of B alone is 0.1. The probability of A alone is 0.2. Okay, let me see if somebody, what's that mean? Can't see. I think I closed up one of my windows, so I can't see if I'm just trying to do something. Okay. Um, and then now there's a typo. I don't know why. Uh, it looks like Microsoft Word is doing something weird. This should be um, a union A union B complement. Okay. So we're going to write down what these things. So we want to talk about what's the probability of A given B. Okay. So let me write these out um, more correctly. So probability of B alone, and then we'll draw our little sample space here too, so we can visualize. So I've got. A, <clears throat> and I have B. Let me see, I'll shade these in a little bit here. I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, here's A, here's B, and then we'll call this spot right here. Which one isn't working? This is where they intersect each other. Okay, so A alone, B alone. So B alone is going to look like this little bit right here. Okay, so B alone looks like that. This is 0 0.1. Okay, so the probability of A, <laughs> A alone, I'm having trouble spelling today. A alone looks like this bit right here. Okay, and we were given that to be equal to 0 0.2. Okay. 
And then this um, A union B complement, right? So remember A union B, so <clears throat> A union B looks like I've got A, I've got B, and then A union B is everything like that. So it's this whole shape, including where they overlap. Okay, so the complement is where nothing happens, okay? So I'm gonna say the probability of A union B complement, this is, let me draw this out like, our sample space looks like this. We've got this shape, here's A, here's B, oops, sorry, and then complement here is where neither occurs. So neither is going to occur. And we were given that probability as 0 0.6. Okay. So now we want to find out what's the probability um, of A given B. Okay. So let's think about um, how we're going to um, tackle this stuff. Okay. So I'm going to start rewriting this stuff. So probability of B alone is equal to the probability of <laughs> probability of, uh, of B uh, and sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, B and A complement, right? That's just so A complement is everything outside of A, right? That's just this bit here, but where B overlaps with that just gives us this little thing. So probability of B intersect A complement, okay, and that's equal to 0 0.1. I'm going to rewrite these things. Probability of A alone, oops, I don't know why I'm having a hard time writing. A alone equals the probability of A intersect B complement, okay, and that was equal to 0 0.2. So that gives us this little sliver here. Okay, and then the probability of neither is equal to 0.6. So I'm going to write it out. The probability of both occurring, right, which is this intersection part. Actually, I'm sorry, the probability of both occurring is right here. <coughs> A union B, which is equal to 1 minus the probability of A union B complement. Okay, so if I want the union, right, my whole sample space, remember, has to be 1. The probability has to be 1. So if I subtract out, right, their complement, I'm going to get the union. Okay, well, that's what's left over. So, like, I'm subtracting out 1 minus the shaded region is going to give me this inside part. Okay, so 1 minus 0 0.6 is equal to 0 0.4. Okay, I'm trying to build up pieces so that I can put them into equations and solve for the parts that I need. Okay, so <clears throat> the probability of A union B is equal to probability of A alone plus the probability of B alone oops, sorry. plus the probability of A intersect B. Okay, so this is my goal, right? I want to solve for the intersection of these two here. So I'm going to plug in the things that I know, right? So this is equal to 0 0.4 equals 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus the probability of A intersect B. Okay, I'm going to add these up and subtract, and then I'm going to get 0 0.1 equals the probability of A intersect B. Okay, I need A intersect B because it's going to help me figure out, right, what's my conditional probability. So remember our conditional probability, A given B, is going to equal to the probability of A intersect B all over the probability of B. This probability of B is B total, the whole circle. So let's write this out. This is going to be our whole circle of B. Okay, not the little sliver part. Okay, so that means <clears throat> what I need to do is um, this is going to equal to 0 0.1 all over 0 0.2. Okay. Because remember, we'll talk about how I got this 0 0.2 in just a minute. This is equal to 0 0.5. It's going to equal to my conditional probability. Let me write this down. Probability of A given B. I'm running out of space here. <clears throat> so we talk about where I got B total, right? So B total comes from, oh, let's do it in a different color. So probability of B total. Let's see, maybe I'll have some space here. I'm going to just borrow some space here. So probability of B is equal to the probability of B alone plus the probability of A intersect B, right? So this is our little sliver. 
this is where they overlap, and that's going to give me the probability of B, which is my total circle. Okay, so we had each individual piece, and we could plug it in, and we can get 0.2 out of it. Okay, when we did that, so that's where that probability of B total comes from. Okay, that's where I got this part right there. Okay. <clears throat> A lot of these things are going to help. Um, I'm trying to belabor this point here so that you can see um, how we're manipulating the different probabilities and how we're building up the things that we know. And then obviously using like Venn diagrams are going to help um, drawing out, right? And then thinking about like what's actually happening here. Okay. I actually like the drawings a lot. It helps me figure out like what's happening. <clears throat> okay. All right. So. A lot of examples here, but they're good examples because they're going to help you think about like what it is that we're trying to do. Okay, so example eight says we have a bucket and it has five white chips in it, four black chips, and three red chips. Four chips are drawn sequentially, one, two, three, four, without replacement. Okay, so we want to find out what's the probability of getting the sequence white, red, white, uh, black. Okay, so it's going to depend like on what we get before we now when we do this, we can get like all sorts of possibilities, right? We can enumerate out the whole tree. Okay. But we're just looking for this sequence. So I'm going to enumerate, I'm going to draw a picture, which is just going to show the partial tree that's going to satisfy. Okay. This sequence here. Okay. But you should know when we see it, I'm going to draw the little branches so that you could see that there are other possibilities. So there's a whole, basically a big web that we could draw. Okay. But we're, I'm only going to follow the path that we're looking for. Okay. I find these kinds of drawings really helpful. So <clears throat> let's think about what's happening. So I've got, first I'm, I'm actually going to draw a high level picture um, that kind of illustrates what's going on. So the first, I've got a bucket. It's got um, five white chips, four black chips, and three red chips. Okay, so there are 12 total chips, okay? My goal is I'm going to take a white chip out. Now I'm going to have four white chips four black chips and three red chips. Sorry, four because I took a white chip out and I'm not replacing it. So now I have only 11 chips left. And the next round, I'm gonna take a red chip out of this new pile here, okay? Which means I'm gonna be left with <coughs> four white chips, four black chips and two red chips because I've just taken one. Okay, so I've got 10 chips left, okay? And then my last bit, okay, or my second last bit is I'm gonna take another white. Okay, from here. And then I've got three white chips, four black chips, two red chips. And I have nine chips total left. And then the last thing I want to do is take a black. So white, red, white, black, right, is going to satisfy the sequence that we were told to look for. Okay, so this kind of gives us the high level picture of what we're trying to do. And now I'm going to draw the tree. And then from the tree, we're going to follow our path to help us calculate out what our total conditional probabilities are. Okay, so Let's start off like this. So I've got um, my bucket starts here. I've got um, 12 chips total. Like this, okay. So now remember, when I take this out, I have the chance of taking out a white chip, a black chip, or a red chip, okay. I'm only gonna follow the path. I'm gonna enumerate the path for the white chip because that's the sequence that I wanna follow. So when I take a white chip out, right, the probability of taking a white chip on the first draw is going to be, right, I've got five white chips out of 12 total. Okay. Now I've got a bucket that has 11 chips left, right? So I've got, oh, I'm not taking a white chip out, so I've got four white, four black, three red. Okay. Now I want to be able to take, right, I can take a white chip out, I can take a red chip out or I can take a black chip out okay I'm gonna follow this path here because that's the sequence that we're looking for so the probability of getting a red chip on the second draw given that we had a white chip on the first draw okay is gonna to equal to <clears throat> let's see well I have three red chips out of 11 total okay so let me do I'll do I'm gonna circle just so we can keep keep our eyes on it okay so now I've got the bucket and I've got 10 chips left. Okay. Right now, remember, I can draw a white chip, I can draw a red chip, or I can draw a black chip. Okay. 
I don't want these, I want to draw a white tip out. Okay, so <clears throat> the probability of drawing a white chip on the third draw given that we've drawn a white chip and a red chip already is going to equal to, well, I have four white chips left out of 10 total. I'm going to circle this one because I need that one. Okay, so we're heading in this path. I'm going to draw it like this because I'm running out of space. Now I'm dealing with my last draw. I've got nine chips total left. Okay. And I remember, I could draw a white chip, a red chip, or a black chip, okay? But I only want the black chip because that was the sequence that we were given, okay? So now the probability of drawing a black chip out on the fourth, given that we've drawn a white chip on the first and a red chip on the second, oops, and a white chip on the third. Sorry, I'm running out of space, okay? This one is going to equal two. I have got four black chips out of nine total. Let me circle this one here. Okay. <clears throat> so our sequence, right, this is the path that we had to take, right, to satisfy the sequence that we were told to look for. Okay. So this is the probability of getting a white chip on the first draw, probability of getting a red chip on the second draw, given that we've chosen a white chip on the first, probability of getting a white chip on the third draw, given that we've chosen a white on the first and a red on the second, Probability of getting a black on the fourth draw, given that we've chosen a white on the first and a red on the second and a white on the third. Okay, so now we need to put all of these together. Okay, let's let's write these up. So the probability of getting a white, just enumerating this out, writing this out clearly, so that you guys will have this in your mind when you're working on things. Okay, PW1 is the probability of getting a white chip on the first draw. Probability of R2 given W1. This is our probability getting a red on the second draw, given that we had a white on the first. Okay. Probability um, W3 given W1. This is our probability of getting a white on the third draw, given that we had a white on the first and a red on the second. In the last bit, probability of getting a black on the fourth given we had a white on the first and a red on the second and a white on the third. Bear with me here as so I write it down. We had a white on the first Red, oops, there should be a two. Red on the second, and a white on the third. Okay, so <clears throat> we're basically looking for we're basically looking for the probability of white one, red two, white three, black four. Okay, and this is going to be equal to the probability of white one <clears throat> times the probability of red two given white one times the probability of white three given white one and R two times the probability of oops, black four given white one, R two, white three. Okay, I'm multiplying all these together. I'm gonna put in, see all these numbers here, right? For each of my individual probabilities, I'm going to put them in here. So this one is 5, 12 times 3, 11 times 4, 10 times 4, 9. I just multiply straight across the top, straight across the bottom. I'm going to get 240 all over 11,880, which is approximately equal to 0 0.02. It's a long example, but it's a good one. 
right? It makes you think about things in sequential order. Okay, like I said, this tree, you can imagine, it's getting really big, right? There's a lot of possibilities for how we can enumerate out everything. I'm not going to enumerate everything because I don't need everything. I just need the path that's going to help me with the sequence that I'm looking for. Okay, and I'm using the numbers, right, of chips that I'm drawing out as I go. And we're saying without replacement, okay? So my probabilities are going to change as I'm going, okay? All right. Oops, sorry. Slack the camera. All right. So let's think about... We often see things that say at least or at most. You know, how do we tackle things like that? Okay. So I want to have at least this many events. I want to have at least that many events. I want to have at most this other event. Okay. So when we do this, right, I can actually, depending on how many things I have, I can enumerate. Like I want to have at least you know, events two through four. Okay, so like that's gonna be event two plus event three plus event four, right? The probabilities that I'm gonna be taking care of. Um, that's finite, that's a small amount that I'm gonna be doing. But say I have like, I've got like a thousand different things happening and I wanna have at least one event that's happening. So that means I could have one event, two events, three events, four events, all the way up to all of them, right? So it's too long for me to do it. So when I'm talking about at least, it is often, much easier to think about a complement, um, complementary calculations on things. One minus nothing happening, or you know the probability of two things minus you know nothing happening. So you have to kind of take a look at at least one event, at least two events, but at least often leads to easier calculations when I think of um, subtraction, one minus something or two minus something. So let's write that down. So multiplication rules, which is what we've been doing. and complementary events okay that's where it's easier to think about with at least so sometimes i'll just write down in words what i just said sometimes it's easier to find the complement than to Calculate everything out exactly. Okay, and that's you're going to have to make your judgment call on that one, um, but often it's much easier to do the complement. Okay, so we'll do some um, examples so that you can see. All right. <clears throat> um, so looking at example number nine. Here we go. Okay, good. So on example nine, we've got a person who's going to select three cards from a deck. And they're going to replace each card after it's drawing. And take one, I'm going to do something with it, I'm going to put it back into the deck. Um, I want to find the probability that the person will get at least one heart. Okay, so I'm pulling it out, looking at it, putting it back, pulling it out, looking at it, putting it back, pulling it out, looking at it. I want to find the probability that I get one heart or two hearts or three hearts on all of these different draws. Okay, so let's think about what we have. So I have the number of hearts in a deck. Right, so I have 52 cards in my deck total. Hearts is a suit, so I have 13 cards total, 13 hearts total in my deck of cards. Okay, so to calculate this directly, right, I'm going to need to calculate the probability of getting one heart, plus the probability of getting two hearts, plus the probability of getting three hearts. It's not impossible, right, because, you know, it's sort of a small set, but um, let's just talk about things. Um, we need And then we're going to add them all together. We can do that, right? But at least, the words at least, okay, means it's the complement of zero hearts. At least one means, you know, like if I if I say if I say at least one, that means I'm ignoring the fact that I could have zero hearts when I pull it out. Okay, so I'm going to be using that as my complementary, okay, um, event, right? So we're going to do that. Um, 
in terms of these three um, these three different tries. So let's try this. So the number of cards that are not hearts. Right. So we said there were 13 hearts in a deck, right? And there are 52 cards. So 52 minus 13 gives me 39 cards that are not hearts. Okay. I'm going to use that. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about my try number one. Right. I'm going to say I've got I pulled out zero cards on the first, zero hearts on the first try. Try two. I pulled out zero hearts on the second try. And on try three, I pulled out zero hearts. Oops, sorry, I ended it on 52. Um, 52. Okay. So I pulled out 39 cards that are zero hearts out of my full deck on each try. This is my, we're pulling out zero hearts on each try. So the probability of no heart on three tries is going to equal to 39 out of 52 times 39 out of 52 times 39 out of 52, which is equal to um, kind of oh, maybe not 0 0.422. Okay, so that gives me zero hearts on all three tries. Okay, so that means that the probability of at least one heart on the three tries is going to be equal to one minus the probability of no hearts on three tries. So one minus 0.422 is going to give me 0 0.578. Okay. The reason we do that is because I also have to take into account the fact that on try one I get you know one heart. Um, on, on try two I get you know three heart, I get um, another heart, but I don't get one on try one. I mean, I have to be able to take into account all the different permutations of, you know, getting these numbers of hearts on each of these tries. So that's why the complementary event is easier in this case, because I do no hearts on the first try, no hearts on the second try, no hearts on the third try. And I subtract that from my overall sample space, which is one, right? And that's going to give me the probability of at least one heart on any one of these tries. <clears throat> okay. So always be thinking about that um, in terms of complementary events. Maybe often it is much easier to calculate out um, than trying to enumerate all the different possibilities. Because in this particular case, also I have to take into account all the different ways that I could get, you know, one heart here, one heart there, you know, or maybe I can get two hearts. I have to add them all. The, the complexity is going to explode, so I don't want to have to deal with that. <clears throat> okay. So actually, let me make sure that you guys have that reading now. Can't see if anybody's still writing. <laughs> okay. So, example 10, we've got a single die, um, it's a six-sided die, and it's going to be rolled four times. So we want to find the probability of getting at least one six, right? <clears throat> so I roll it four times with the probability of getting one six, okay? So that means that probability of getting at least one six. This is hard to write, so you know, it doesn't look like a 16. The probability of getting at least one six is equal to the probability of one six plus the probability of two sixes plus the probability of three sixes plus the probability of four sixes, okay? Which is actually equal to one minus the probability of no sixes. Okay, it's going to be easier to think about a complementary event. Okay, so let's think about, so, <clears throat> If the probability of getting one six is going to be one six, right? The probability of getting no six at all, it's a six sided die, it's going to be, I have five other numbers out of six possibilities. Okay, so I'm going to think about five six. So I've got try one on the first roll, I get no sixes. So that's the probability of five six. Try two, I get no sixes. Try three, I get no sixes. And then try four, I get no sixes again. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to take all of these different tries and I'm going to put them together. So the probability of getting no sixes at all on each of these four tries is five six times five six times five six times five six, which I'm going to write as five six to the fourth, multiplying it together four times, just shorthand notation. Okay, so the probability of at least one six is equal to one minus five or six to the fourth. Okay, 
And then I can just add it up, you know, multiply it out on my calculator. So I'm going to get um, <clears throat> zero. This is approximately equal to 0 0.518. Okay. Give you guys a minute to finish writing that down. <clears throat> I've been posting these two to Blackboard, so please let me know if you can't reach them. They're under our lecture examples folder, but under the lecture example solutions subfolder in there. So I scan them in um, in the afternoon and then post them. All right. <clears throat> so let's think about, um, I want to talk about something slightly related. Okay, so this is, um, we want to think about unconditional. Unconditional and inverse probability. The inverse probability is our Bayes rule. Okay, we're going to talk about that um, in just a little bit. So let's think about our sample space. This is our whole sample space. Now let's imagine that our sample space is totally partitioned. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this out kind of randomly. So I've got my event A1. I've got my event A2. There's no rhyme or reason to how I'm drawing these out A3. I'm just trying to draw this so that they're partitioned in such a way so that our whole event space is being taken up by stuff. These things are not overlapping each other like that. Okay. So this is A sub n. Like this is A sub 4, A sub 5, all the way up to however many partitions we have A sub n. Okay. So we're going to say each A, call it A sub i, is mutually exclusive. Right? We can see that they're not overlapping. This shouldn't be here. They're not overlapping. Okay. <laughs> now remember, when they're mutually exclusive, right? I can say that my a sub i intersect with a sub j is equal to the null set. They don't intersect where um, i and j don't equal to each other. Okay. So they're not um, overlapping at all. And so then I can say that my sample space is made up of all of these, right? This is all this is saying, right? My sample space is A1 plus A2, the union of A1 and the union with A2, with A3, A4, A5, all the way up to A sub n, right? My sample space is made up of all of these things, all unioned together, okay? And then we're also going to stipulate that our probabilities are non-zero, okay? So something's going to happen, okay? So that means I can say, if I've got some event B, let's just draw it like this. And I'll shade this in. So B is going to overlap partially or in full with some of these events here, right? So I've got my event B sitting on top of all of these different partition sample spaces. So I'm going to say that the probability of B is equal to the sum of the probability of B given each A sub I that it sits on, right? Because B is going to be dependent on A sub I happening, right? And I need to be able to sum up that A sub I and the conditional probability of B in A sub I, okay? So we're going to write this is the sum of all conditional probabilities, okay? <clears throat> Let you guys think about that. Now we're going to take a look at bless you, my daughter. Um, we're going to take a look at example 11. Example 11 says um, bucket one has two red chips and four white chips. Bucket two has three red chips and one white chip. And a chip is drawn from bucket one and it's placed into bucket two. We get a lot of questions like this. I've got bucket one. I take something out and I don't know what it is, but I'm going to put it into bucket two. And then I'm going to take something out of bucket two, right? And then I'm going to say, what's the probability? after I take something out of bucket two, that the chip that we draw is going to be red. Now remember, we've changed the original probabilities of red and white chips because I've taken one out of bucket one. I don't know what it is. But I've placed it into bucket two, and now I have to do it. So I have to be able to think about what's happening. So <clears throat> let's just draw a quick high-level picture, and then we'll talk about um, how do we enumerate out what our possibilities are. Okay, so I've got, here's my bucket one. 
this is one. And I've got two red chips and four white chips. I find it um, nice to draw out the pictures so that I can visualize what's happening. And here's bucket two. And then I have three red chips and one white chip to start, right? So I take a chip, let me see if you can see what I'm doing. So I take a chip from here. This is one chip. So I take a chip from bucket one and I place it into bucket two. So this has a total of six chips. And this, to start, this has a total of four chips, but then we increase that to five. We don't know. Am I increasing the white or am I increasing the red? I'm going to increase one of those two, but I've increased the total. So I have to kind of think about what's happening. And then I'm going to draw one chip. Okay. And what we're looking for here is what's the probability of drawing a red chip? And we'll call it on the second thing that we've drawn. Okay. So I take one out of bucket one, place it into bucket two, then I take one out of bucket two, and I want to know what's the probability that it could be a red. Okay. When I don't know which chip I've taken out of bucket one, so I have to be able to calculate that out. Okay. So let's draw out <coughs> our possibilities. Okay. I like to draw these trees so that we can see what's happening. It helps visualize what you're trying to do. So I'm going to start with bucket one. I have two red chips and four white chips. Okay. Now, out of bucket one, right, I can draw a red chip or I can draw a white chip. We're going to do both, right? So it's going to change our probabilities either way. So the probability of drawing a red chip on the first, right? So I've got two red chips out of six total. So that gives me the probability of drawing a red chip out of the first bucket. Probability of drawing a white chip on the first draw. I've got four white chips out of six total. So my probability of drawing a white is four out of six. <clears throat> now I'm going to take these and I'm going to place them into bucket two. This is bucket two. Now remember, bucket two started off looking like this. Okay, but now I've just added a red chip, right? So my quantity of red chips goes up, but my white chips stay the same, okay? And then from here, I'm gonna draw a chip, I'm gonna draw a red chip, or I'm gonna draw a white chip. And we wanna know like what's actually happening. So this is the probability of drawing a red chip on the second draw, whoops, sorry, given that we've drawn a red chip on the first, okay? So I'm gonna draw a red chip out of here, and this is, I have five total chips, so I have four red chips out of five total. And I'll just write down the white one here, even though um, we're not necessarily calculating it. So this is a probability of drawing a white chip on the second draw, given that we've drawn a red chip on the first draw. And this here is, I've got one white chip out of five. Okay, but this is the one, I'm gonna circle this because we're looking at drawing a red chip. Okay, so that's if I did the red first. So now, what would happen if I actually drew a white chip? So this is my bucket two, okay. So remember, I would have started, I'm back here again. So I've got three red chips and I'm adding a white chip now, so two white chips. Okay, so I still have five chips total, right? Sorry, can you see that? I still have five chips total, right? But now I wanna know I can draw a red chip or I can draw a white chip. And we wanna know what our probabilities are for this. So now the probability of drawing a red chip on the second, given that I drew a white on the first, <clears throat> right? So I have three red out of five. This one here, I'll just write down, I'm gonna circle this one because this is the one that we want to look at. But I'll just write down the probability for the white even though we're not calculating it. So the probability of drawing a white chip on the second given that we drew a white chip on the first. So I have two white chips out of five. Okay, just so that you can see what things look like. So my path to getting a red chip, now we wanna look at what's the probability of getting a red chip. Right, so I'm looking here. This path for red is my final outcome this path for red is my final outcome. I've got two different ways of actually getting there. So let's write down <coughs> probability of getting a red on the second is equal to probability of getting a red on the first times probability of getting a red on the second, given that we got a red on the first, plus you've got this other path that we could have taken, probability of getting a white on the first times probability of getting a red on the second, given that we got a white on the first. Okay, we have all these numbers already, right? here, here, okay, for our individual probabilities, and then here, here for our joint probabilities. So we'll start filling this in. So this right here is two, six times <clears throat> four fifths. That details out this path right here, okay? 
plus, I'm going to detail out this path now, um, for 6 times 3 fifths. Okay, so I'm just going to multiply it and then combine. So I'm going to get in the end 20 out of 30, which is 2 thirds. Okay, this is the probability. Oops, so you can see that. Probability of drawing a red out of bucket two. Okay. Move this down so hopefully you can see everything. Okay. It helps to draw the pictures, right? <laughs> so that you can see the pathway, right? And then calculate what we need to do. Okay. Remember, we started here, we drew a red chip, we put it into bucket two, we drew a red chip out. We started here, we drew a white chip, put it into bucket two, we drew a red chip out. Okay. This is going to satisfy the criteria that we're looking for. Okay. So these are the things this path plus this path are going to give us our total probability of getting a red chip out on the second. <clears throat> okay, example 12. Simple 12 says we have a deck of cards, the 52 cards, and it's shuffled, and the card on the top is removed. What's the probability that the second card that we take off is going to be an ace? Okay, so we need to think about this. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to draw a picture again too. So I've got my deck of cards. I've got 52 cards in the deck. Okay, this is what I'm starting with. Let's say the first card that I draw, I draw an ace on the first card, right? Because it's possible I could have drawn an ace on the first card. The probability of getting an ace on the first card is, right, I have four aces total out of 52 cards. Okay, that's that. Now I have 51 cards left in my deck. Because I've taken this card off, I'm not removing it. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not replacing it, right? Now I want to know what's the probability of getting an ace on the second card, okay? So this is going to be the probability of getting an ace on the second card, given that we got an ace on the first card, okay? So now here, I have, I took an ace out, so I have one less ace than I would have to start from, and I have one less card in the whole deck. So I have three out of 51. <clears throat> That's my possibility. Now, let's talk about the other option, which is the first card that we drew was not an ace, okay? So we'll call this ace one complement. So no ace on first draw, okay? So ace complement. So that means that the probability of ace complement on the first draw, okay, is I have four aces in a deck of 52. That means I have 48 non-ace cards. So this is 48 out of 52, the probability of not getting an ace on the first draw. Okay, so I still have taken only one card off, so I'm here at 51, okay? And now I want to know if I get an ace on the second draw, because I'm looking for possibilities. The possibility here is that the first card was an ace, or that the first card was not an ace, but I'm looking at the probability here. So the probability that ace two on the second draw, given that the first card was not an ace, okay? So it didn't reduce the overall aces in the pile. So I have four aces still to choose from, but I did reduce my overall sample set. Okay. So I'm going to be looking at <coughs> writing this out as probability of A2, which is the probability of getting an ace on the second draw is, let's write that out, ace on second card. It's going to equal to the probability of getting an ace on the first card times the probability of getting an ace on the second card, given that we got an ace on the first card. That was path one, plus the probability of getting an ace, um, <clears throat> let's see, no aces on the first card, times the probability of getting an ace on the second card, given that we did not get an ace on the first card. Okay, we just calculated out these numbers, right? This path here and this path here. So I'm gonna plug those into here. So I'm gonna get four, out of 52 times 3 out of 51 plus 48 out of 52 times 4 out of 51. Okay, I just multiply here, multiply here, and then add these two up together. This is going to give me approximately 0 0.0769. Okay, there are two ways that I can get an ace on the second card, right? If I, the first card is an ace, the first card is not an ace. 
Okay, but I want to know what's the probability of getting ace on the second card. Okay, right here. <clears throat> Moving right along. I know these are a lot of examples. You can bear with me. Um, this is timely an example. So this says um, we have a congressional race. Example 13. Now I'm on, by the way. Um, we have a congressional race, and the incumbent um, person is a Republican. We'll call him R. Um, and, this, and that person is running against one of three possible Democrats: D1, D2, D3. The Democrats have to have a primary, right, before they can um, nominate a particular person to actually run in the general, right? So the Democrats have a primary, and the probability of each of those Democrats winning the primary is D1 is 0.35, D2 is 0.4, D3 is 0.25. <clears throat> polls. Polls suggest that the um, Republican candidate has a chance of defeating each Democrat in the general as follows. 40% chance against Democrat 1, 35% chance against Democrat 2, 60% chance against Democrat 3. So now we want to know what's the probability that the Republican wins the general election, okay, given all of these different probabilities. Okay, so let's write down what we have in terms of probabilities, right, and then we can start putting things together. So probability R is, this is what we're looking for. This is the probability that our, our candidate wins the general. Okay, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to solve for. So the probability D1 is the probability that Dem 1 wins primary, which we were given as 0 0.35. Oops, it doesn't look very good. 0.35. Probability of D2. This is a probability that D2 wins the primary, which we were given as 0 0.4. Probability of D3. This is D3 wins the primary, which is um, 0 0.25. Okay. So now <clears throat> our conditional probability says the probability that the Republican wins against Democrat 1 in the general, okay, is going to be equal to 0 0.4, okay. Probability that the Republican wins against Democrat 2, right, because this is the probability that the Republican wins given that the Democrat 1 won the primary. This one, Democrat 2, is 0 0.35. Probability that the Republican wins against Democrat 3 is equal to 0 0.6. Okay, so we have our conditional probabilities. We have our individual probability. We have our goal. Okay, so we're going to put things together. <clears throat> probability that the Republican wins the general is the probability that the Republican wins against Democrat 1, given that Democrat 1 won the primary. Plus, <clears throat> Republican wins against Democrat 2, given that the Democrat 2 won the primary, times the probability that the Democrat 2 won the primary plus the probability that the Republican wins against Democrat 3, given that Democrat 3 won the primary. So you can think of these conditional probabilities as like weights, right? Like, so what's the likelihood of Democrat 1 winning in the primary? And then what's the conditional probability of this Republican winning against them? It's kind of, all of this is like a, kind of like a weighted, right? A way of thinking about um, how all this is going to come together. All right, so let's put things together. This is going to be 0 0.4 times 0 0.35, right? I'm filling in the blanks from what we had, plus <clears throat> 0 0.35 times 0 0.4, just coincidence that they're the same, plus 0 0.6 times 0 0.25, okay? Now I'm gonna multiply all those out and add together and I get 0.43, which is like saying there's a 43% chance that the Republican wins general. Oops. Wins general. Okay? So how we think about things. So we can get all of that in the screen there. Okay, I'll give you guys a second to write that down. And then we'll talk about base theorem. This is our last bit for the chapter section. <clears throat> So let's think about um, what's called Bayes' theorem. There's an E in it, Bayes' theorem. And this is a really new thing. Um, <clears throat> so Bayes' theorem, it's like an extension of conditional probability. Okay, 
the extension, but it's like seeing, um, like we've got all the, we've got, you know, bucket one, I'm going to bucket two, bucket whatever. And then I've got an outcome. I'm going to start from my outcome. I'm going to say, given that this was our outcome, what's the probability that this was the beginning? Okay. So Bayes theorem is like a way of going in reverse from working your way backward from the outcome. Okay. So let's think about, we call this, what we call it inverse probability because we're working our way back from the outcome. Okay. <clears throat> Let me write it down and then we'll talk about it. It's a lot of like math jargon here, but um, basically it's just a way to work backwards from the outcome. Okay. So base theorem, let me actually write it down. So Bayes' theorem states, I've got um, the probability A sub J given B is equal to the probability. It'll make more sense when we work through an example. You can see what we mean by all of this. Okay, so let me write this down in words. So what this is saying is we've got um, the conditional probability of this event, a sub j, right? So the b given a sub j times the probability of a sub j. So that's the conditional probability of that particular event happening, right? All over the sum of all probabilities that is going to, oops, sorry, you can't see that some of all probabilities that's going to help you lead up to this particular event, right? Because I'm looking for B given A sub I, you know, I'm going to sum up all the possible ways that I could get that, but I was told it looks like this ways, but I have all these other possibilities. So it's like a weighted, right? I've got this weight here. So what's like the probability that this probability is going to happen? It's a weighted um, way to think about it. So some questions to ask yourself, let me actually make sure that you guys have it written down. <clears throat> I can't see if you're still writing. So some questions to ask yourself when you're doing base theorem, like is it gonna apply or not? <clears throat> Let's write this down and then we'll do an example. Okay, so some questions to ask yourself when you're doing this stuff. So the first one is, is the problem that you're working on asking for an unconditional probability. This is a partition sample space. Where, right, where our sample space is equal to probability of B given A sub I. We're going to sum our sample space is the sum of all those partitions. And then B is just the sum of all of those um, individual A sub I. Remember, all the events are mutually exclusive. Okay. Or is it a conditional probability, which is going to lead to Bayes' theorem being applied. Mostly we're going to be talking about um, our conditional probabilities, okay, and we're going to be using Bayes' theorem. Um, it's a pretty common thing to use. So um, if it's unconditional, you just write it down, then we'll talk about Bayes. If it's unconditional, we're going to let B mean the event whose probability you are looking for. Okay, if it's unconditional, B is the event um, that you're looking for, the probability that you're looking for. If it's conditional, remember if, um, B is gonna depend on other things, we're gonna let B be the event That has already happened. Remember, that's the whole nature of conditional. Right? B needs to have happened before something else can happen. Okay, so then once we've identified B, we 
you can go back and assign a sub i's. Um, this is a lot of words. It's going to make more sense when I actually work through an example so that you can see like how this is actually um, coming into play. I just wanted to put these things down so that you can kind of think about it. Okay, um, think about what that means. So let's go. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a second to finish writing that. Okay, so we're going to go to our last example, um, example 14, which is going to use a base. Okay, so um, in this example, it says <coughs> a biased coin is tossed. Okay, so in the past, like we've, we've assumed that our coins have been unbiased, so it's equally likely to get a head or a tail. Okay, 50% chance either way. If it's biased, I need to know how it's biased so I can calculate the probability of heads and probability of tails. So we're told it's biased in this way. It's twice as likely to come up heads as it is tails. We'll figure out our exact probabilities in a minute. If we get a head, okay, then a chip is drawn from bucket one, which has three white and four red. <clears throat> if we get a tails, then the chip is drawn from bucket two, which has six white and three red. Okay, now we're told the answer. Okay, we have the answer. We drew a white chip. Okay. So what we want to know is, I drew a white chip, so what's the probability that I actually flip the tails, right? So what we've done so far is, we've calculated out the probability of getting a white, right? So I've got the head or tails, I've got all these different possibilities, I could get white from these different routes, so I'm going to sum those up so I get that. I'm telling you, we drew a white, we want to know, let's go backwards and see what's the probability of actually getting a tails, okay? So let's first off, let's calculate what our probabilities are for our coin, okay? because we're going to need that when we fill out our tree of possibilities, okay? So let's work on it. <clears throat> but this one is, given that we're given the answer, we want to find the question. So we're going to work backwards. Okay, so we're going to work backwards from our answer, which is that we drew a white chip. We want to find out like what the question is, which is, is it a coin of tails? Okay, so we have a biased coin. Okay, so we were told that the probability of getting a head is equal to um, twice the probability of getting a tails. Okay, and I know on a coin I can only get a, a head or a tail, so that means that the probability of a head plus the probability of a tail must sum to one. Okay, so I have two equations and two unknowns. So I'm going to plug in into here. So I'm going to get 2 times the probability of tails plus the probability of tails equals 1, which is going to give me my probability of tails is equal to 1 third, which means my probability of heads, because it sums up to 1, is going to be 2 thirds. Okay, so I had to do some initial calculation in order to figure out well, how it, were the probabilities of the heads or tails, because it was a biased coin. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's set up our, um, our tree of possibilities. Okay. So I've got this coin that I'm going to toss, right? And when I toss it, I could get a head or I could get a tail, right? Now, remember, let's write it down. So the probability of getting a head is equal to 2 thirds. And the probability of getting a tail is equal to 1 third, okay? If I get <laughs> a head, we were told this at the beginning. If I get a head, I'm going to go to bucket 1. Okay, so this is bucket one, which has three white chips and four red chips, okay? Now, I'm going to take one of these chips out. I could get a white chip, or I could get a red chip, okay? Now, remember, in the end, we were told that we got a white chip, okay? So I'm telling you what the answer is, right? So we know, I'm going to circle this with a red pen. We know that that's the path, right? It has to be this one here, but we'll write down what our probabilities are. So I'm looking at the probability of a white chip being drawn given that I got a head, okay? So I'm here. I've got three white chips out of seven total. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at this one here. I'm going to write down what the, um, this probability is here just so you can see it, but we're not going to be using it. So the probability of getting a red chip given that a head was drawn. So I've got four red chips out of seven total. I'm just writing it down, but we're not going to use it because we're looking, we were told we actually pulled a white chip up. So now let's go back to the beginning. I actually flip the tail instead, which means I'm going to go to bucket two, which has six white chips and three red chips. 
and this is bucket two. Okay, so from bucket two, I can draw a white chip, that's a W, or a red chip. Okay, let's do this. We were told it was white, so I'm going to circle that one because that's the path that we have to take. So this is the probability of getting a white chip given that its tail was flipped, right? So I've got six white chips out of nine total. And because this is the path, I'm just going to circle it so that I remember to stay there. I'll put down this probability for the red, even though we're not going to use it. The probability of getting a red, given that a tail was flipped. So I've got three red out of nine. Okay. <clears throat> but because we did white, this is the path that we want to take here. <laughs> so now we're going to use Bayes' theorem because we're working backwards from our answer to find out what our question was. The question was, was it a head or a tail? So I'm going to say the probability that we want to find, the probability that a tail was um, gotten given that we got a white chip at the end. Okay, which means that I have a probability of a white chip being drawn given that I flipped the tail times the probability of tails, right? Because this is, right, I want to know, like, did we get a tail on the first one? Because if we did get a tail, this is the path that we did follow for sure, okay? And that's going to be divided by, well, I have multiple paths for withdrawing the mirror to this together. I have multiple paths for getting a white chip out, right? So I have to be able to sum up those. So I'm gonna write this down, probability of white, given a tail times the probability of tails, plus my other path, which is the probability that I um, got a white chip given that a head was flipped times the probability of heads, okay? Multiple paths for getting a white chip out. This is the path that we were looking for because that's the question we were asked. Did we get a tail? Did we, did we flip a tail? Uh, given that we pulled a white chip out. Okay, so let's fill in the numbers based on our path. Okay, so the probability of a white given the tail, we got this, this is six over nine times, remember we had to follow this path, probability of tails times one third. All over, we have to sum things up. So this is six over nine times one third plus, right, I have to follow this path here, which is my upper path. That's gonna be um, three over seven times two over three. Okay, and I'm gonna add these up, right? Oops, sorry, I'm sorry, you can see that. Sorry about that. I'm going to add these up, okay, and then do fraction divided by fraction. And so in the end, I'm going to get, oh, just write it out so you can see it, 6 out of 27 all over, which is equal to 7 out of 16, right, because I divided by fraction, and that is all equal to 0, point, approximately equal to 0 0.4375. This is the probability, right, that given that I've actually drawn a white chip, the chip, the probability that I actually flipped the tail at the very beginning, so 0.437. That's about a 43.7% chance that given that I have a white chip, I flipped the tail at the beginning. And it makes sense, because right, because it's the coin is biased against tail. So it kind of makes sense to me that the probability is going to be a little bit smaller. Okay. And that's Bayes' theorem. Um, it is something that you'll see, especially um, like I said. Um, this comes up in neuroscience and um, artificial neural networks. Um, incidentally, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, when um, modeling the activity of the brain became a really big thing, we were going to learn about how the, the brain actually functions, and we're going to use biological neural networks instead of artificial neural networks. And in the process of studying how the brain actually functions, right, and how decisions are made in the brain in terms of like which neurons connect to which and which firing patterns happen, we realized <clears throat> that actually the brain, our brain, uses Bayes' theorem. Right? So we didn't have to actually use these complicated biological networks because our brain actually used Bayes' theorem in order to calculate out these probabilities. So now we're actually using Bayes' theorem when we use a model of the brain, and we're using Bayes' theorem um, when we talk about artificial neural networks because it does mimic um, how our, our brains actually function and process questions. Okay, so <clears throat> that's chapter 2.4, and then tomorrow we'll, um, we'll do 2.5 and then maybe 2.6. If we don't get to 2.6 tomorrow, I'm totally fine. 2.6 will not be on the quiz, and I'm not collecting homework for 2.6. Okay, I don't even think I've posted homework for 2.6 yet. Um, 2.6 will be included next week. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, if you guys want to think about it, um, take a look at, um, take a look at your notes, um, kind of mull things over, um, take a break. Uh, we'll have office hours at 12:30, um, about 45 minutes, and then um, you want to ask me questions on the homework. It's totally fine. You can go all the way back to chapter 2.2, 2.3, or 2.4. You can ask me questions on. Okay. Bye, you guys. Have a great day.